Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today, as promised, here is the second and final part of my interview with Adiinka Mackinde. And just in case you didn't hear the first part last week, let me just introduce my guest. Adiinka Mackinde trained as a barrister and is a lecturer in criminal law and public law at a university in London. His research interests include intelligence and security matters, and he is regularly published online and has served as a programme consultant for BBC World Service Radio, China Radio International and The Voice of Russia. Now, of course, if you didn't hear that first part, I highly recommend that you do, because obviously the two parts are a whole, and references are made in the second part that depend upon one's having heard the first part. So please do go back and listen to that if you haven't already heard it. So in the first part, we spoke about more recent years, as we were talking about uh, Adyinka's essay, The Pan-Islamic Option, the West's part in the creation and sustaining of Islamic terror. But in the second part, we turn our attention to the slightly more distant past, slightly more distant, and discuss some of the indications from earlier in the 20th century of the West's use and, to some extent, manufacture of violent Islamism for its own various geopolitical agendas. So we pick up there with the question I left hanging in the air last time. And one of the first places that you go to in your discussion here is Germany, and you start by looking at Heinrich Himmler giving a 1944 speech where he is basically saying that Islam is ideal. If you're going to be a soldier, well, why not be an Islamist? And you also go back beyond that to Kaiser Wilhelm's views of Muslims as good for guerrilla warfare. So do you want to tell us about Germany's cultivation of Islam, Islamism, for the purposes of war? Yes, I think it may be a forgotten matter, uh, except those who are trained or educated in um, 20th century history. European history. Mm. But for the common person, um, perhaps their route to having knowledge of that German connection with the uh, use of Islam as a weaponized force to uh, achieve geopolitical aims was the um, John Bocken novel, Green Mantle. That was a piece of British propaganda by a man who was actually associated with the British intelligence. And it was actually based in fact, although it was loosely based on fact. So with the Germans, it was a question of their needs in the First World War and the Second World War. And that link actually between Kaiser Wilhelm and the Third Reich, there was a link between a certain person named Max von Oppenheim. He came from the banking family, diplomat, a lawyer, But when I say diplomat, he only managed to become an attaché because he was denied status as a full diplomat because of his part Jewish heritage. But um, Oppenheim wrote on separate occasions um, at the start of the First and Second World Wars. Uh, He composed two famous memorandums known as Denskript, basically position papers in which he called on Germany to use the Islamic world in a war to help them win. So in the case of the First World War, it was about helping the central powers, the Kaisers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, to beat the blockade by the Western allies who were encircling them, and uh, Russia was an ally, beat them by undermining the British Empire, getting the British colony of the Raj of India to be uh, set ablaze by Islamists and also Persia. And in the same way, later on in July 1940, just after Britain had been beaten back from Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain was about to commence, he also brought up the idea that had been formulated decades before by him, wherein the Germans should use Islamist guerrillas in North Africa And as they got closer to the Caucasus regions of the old Soviet Union, because Germany wanted to reach the oil fields of Baku before they were defeated in the Battle of Stalingrad, you know, to use those uh, Muslim societies to instigate rebellions against the Soviets and again help the German advantage. Right. And this um, is Oppenheim, you say? 
Yes, Max von Okay, so, and he straddles both of those periods of history, the First World War, the Second World War. Yes. Was it he who was suggesting... He, you, you, talk about, you, you talk about pamphleteering. I think this was during Wilhelm's time, to actually pamphleteer Muslims in British territories and to actually incite them to form cells, rebel cells, and go out and kill Europeans in the name of jihad. Was it that his idea, do you think? Um, the basic idea was his. Later on, a policy was formulated. What he contributed to uh, it and what he didn't uh, may be murky. Hmm. But what did happen afterwards was a man called uh, Oscar von Neidemeyer, who was a soldier, he was an academic and a spy par excellence. He led this contingent of Germans, along with the Ottoman people who represented the successor of the Ottomans, that is the young Turks who had seized power. Uh, he led them on this expedition to Afghanistan. You know, the idea was to foment revolution. And um, part of the whole plan was, apart from getting Afghanistan, which was a British protectorate, to rebel, along that line where Turkey as I'd said it previously, in regard to the contemporary circumstance of the Erdogan government, Turkey in those days also had that pan-Turkic dream, and they went along with it. And the idea was, as you've correctly um, quoted, was that um, they would create these bands of Muslim assassins who would set upon expatriate uh, Western Christians you know, to kill them and rise up against them, almost as uh, what occurred uh, in the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. That would be happening areas of the Balkans, right through uh, Central Asia, all those areas that were within the British Empire, Muslim communities governed by the British Empire, or those in, in outlying areas. The problem was that there were problems with the logistics, there were problems with the overall planning, uh, it was all very well for the Germans to understand the Mohammedan faith to be one that was very stringent and uh, aggressive. But it was another thing to understand the complexities of the different communities. You know, for instance, they didn't seem to factor in the difference between Sunnis and Shias. Right. You know, who exactly was going to obey that? Or, or, uh, <laughs> if, you know, would, would, would an imam of, from a different uh, sect uh, instruct uh, another? Most unlikely. Also, um, the whole idea about, well, if you do start that kind of insurrection, What's there to tell the difference between a white Western European who is, uh, you know, French or British from your Germanic allies, you know? So uh, it wasn't yeah. particularly well thought out. And um, in that battle, it has to be said, there was a parallel plan, which obviously won out with the British through the personage of uh, Lawrence of Arabia. But um, uh, Oscar van Neidemeyer, he's uh, uh, really an extraordinary individual, uh, despite that failure. A number of the photographs he took on his lengthy journey all the way through Persia to Afghanistan, they're now uh, UNESCO heritage photographs. Um, he lost out. And, and basically what happened, it, it turned out that when he got to Afghanistan, you know, and the emir kept him and his party waiting, the British uh, basically opt the amount of money they paid to the uh, emir because the Germans were offering him a certain amount of money. And when the British uh, heard of that, uh, they just opt their offer to him. And uh, that was the end of that. But they did try. And um, if you recall, they were, to a certain extent, successful when it came to uh, Russia uh, by using Bolshevism, you know, Lenin and the sealed train. Well, yes, you do mention that. Yes, I've heard that before, yes. and I don't really know much of the detail of that. But he, not just he, was it? I believe it was other revolutionaries as well. Were given there were other this people. passage across Germany yes. to cause trouble, essentially. That was, Absolutely. As as the were. It's yeah. part yeah. of this policy of revolution's politics. So that was used to foment revolution in uh, Russia, and the Bolsheviks did eventually seize power, and there was a lull in the fighting on Germany's Eastern Front and, you know, the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. And also the Ukraine, that wasn't too successful, but Germany did declare the first modern Ukrainian state. Mm. 
And so those actually came later. The blueprint was what we're talking about, using weaponized Islamics to foment unrest in areas controlled or adjoining the British Empire. Uh, but it was a real geostrategic policy. Mm. And um, before we move on, it's worth just talking about blowback, which will okay. feature in each of these adventures in Libya, in Syria, in Afghanistan, Operation Cyclone. The blowback was that, yes, Bolshevism was successfully established in Russia. But uh, what happened later on, of course, was that Stalinist Russia, the Soviet Union, was the power that defeated uh, Germany right. in the Second World War. Yes. Yes, we will come back to this notion of blowback, because it depends mm. on which angle you're coming at with that. I mean, when we talk about blowback with respect to terrorism happening in the West as a consequence of warfare in the Middle East, you know, that can be criticised as an analysis if it's just taken in a one-dimensional way, that every terrorist attack that happens is a, is a result of blowback, because it can obscure deeper questions, which you actually are asking in this very piece itself, sure. as to sure. what extent intelligence agencies themselves may be actually involved in in abetting some of these acts. So if we put everything down to blowback, that can obscure that. And this is something that Tom Secker criticises, relying upon that explanation entirely. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, when we turn to Heinrich Himmler, I wasn't aware of just how many Muslim soldiers he'd actually managed to build into these SS divisions. It was hundreds of thousands, apparently. I didn't realise it was anything like that. Yes, um, I think those who have studied the Third Reich, even with a, in a cursory manner, may be familiar with a picture of these Bosnian Muslim soldiers uh, with fezes, and they're reading a book in German, you know, and its translation is um, Judaism and Islam. Um, I think the fundamentals, as I think you'd mentioned in our earlier discussion, <laughs> which <laughs> uh, sometimes one doesn't remember whether it occurred in our main conversation or what we were ah, talking yes. about before. But anyway, you mean before the interview started. That's right. Yes. yes. Um, Himmler was interested in Islam in the sense that Islam was this practical religion which a soldier could understand. Hmm. What are you dying for? Of course, the Nazis were about expansion of German territory, German glory, getting rid of the Bolsheviks, that sort of thing. But what do you get in return? And certainly for somebody who is about to die, that is a very, very important uh, consideration. And um, I think what Himmler was doing was sort of contrasting Christian theology with the Islamic one. People are now familiar with this uh, promise of uh, 72 virgins, is it, uh, for an Islamic soldier who dies in the cause of spreading Islam? Well, there is uh, an inherent weakness there, it seems to me, that can be exploited. And it seems to me that what we're discussing here is the rather cynical exploitation of that weakness within Islam. I mean, you say that's something that can be debated at the beginning of your essay, in fact. Yes, in terms of Islam as a religion as a whole, yes. Um, but the issue about how it affects a soldier and motivates them, mm. I think what Himmler was thinking about was the paganism he hoped to impose in Germany over the course of time. I think he realized it would take time for Catholicism and Protestantism to die out, but um, they wanted it supplanted. And um, that Islam the aspect of Islamic religious ideology was in sync with Norse mythology. Uh -huh. Because in Norse mythology, of course, you have the Valkyries who select who will live and who will die in battle. And these maidens will take those dead to Valhalla, the preserve of the god Odin. Oh, interesting. And, yes. and in fact, there is a painting of uh, Otto von Bismarck, the creator of the Prussian Empire. There is a painting called The Apotheosis of Bismarck, where you see him being carried into the heavens by these uh, maidens, uh, Valkyries. Yes, indeed, the Nazis did have an eye for mythology, did they not? And how useful that could be in, in their aims, yes. Ab absolutely. And um, congruent to that was that another half of the dead soldiers would be under the preserve of the goddess Freya, who uh, had this great field for the soldiers, the dead soldiers, uh, martyred soldiers, uh, in the Wolfanger. That's the uh, great field. And she's the goddess of sex, beauty, fertility. 
So Himmler could see that congruence between Islamic uh, theology and the way it would motivate soldiers. And I must say that uh, both Hitler and Himmler, particularly when the war was coming to an end, did ruminate could they have used these Muslim soldiers more? Because um, there's a feeling that they did not use them enough in North Africa and uh, as they approached the Caucasus. Because um, in their racial thinking, they refer to Christianity as uh, basically an offshoot of Judaism, to which they obviously had an antipathy towards, and they felt it was weak. Mm -hmm. Himmler and Hitler, they actually felt that it would have been a good idea for Europe to have been Islamicized and, you know, mm. the spread of Islam shouldn't have been stopped at the Battle of Tours. Mm. They felt it was this practical religion that met the daily needs of uh, not just the society, but uh, so soldiers in battle. Fascinating. What role do you think this guy called Muhammad Amin al-Husseini played in all this, who was the first Grand Mufti of Jerusalem? Um, I understand that he was rather on board with, with the Nazis, largely because of his own anti-Semitism, etc. Um, and he went and spoke to Hitler and Himmler, and out of that came this mass recruitment of Muslim soldiers. I mean, what kind of impact do you think he had on that kind of thinking that you've just been talking about? Um, I'm not aware of how much it was. I mean, he certainly did go to the uh, the Germans, but essentially on the premise of the enemy of my enemies is my friend. Yeah. We have to remember that although the uh, insurgents in Palestine who were fighting for a Jewish state decided to either cease fire or join the British army, some elements in Zionism were equally minded to join forces with um, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Um, this is uh, Jair Stern of the infamous uh, Stern gang. So all these issues uh, do factor in there. Uh, but I'm not too knowledgeable about what impact uh, the Mufti practically had. Mm. But the Germans uh, certainly, um, in the First World War and in the Second World War, they did establish these camps where, you know, the Islamic soldiers, their needs were catered to, you know, dietary needs and their religious needs. Uh, and, and they were trained to serve within the ranks of uh, the German armed forces. It's fascinating. It's very complicated, isn't it? <laughs> One has to qualify everything that's said. It's very interesting. Um, let's turn to Britain then. So you've got some examples here of British use and indeed cultivation of Islamic forces during the days of empire. And while I was looking at the background to this, I turned to Mark Curtis's book, Secret Affairs, Britain's Collusion with Radical Islam, which I recommend for a catalogue of examples, very well documented and well articulated. I haven't finished reading it yet, but I'm finding it compelling. Um, so you mentioned the Ikhwan army under Ibn Saud, who I believe became the first king of Saudi Arabia, and the British made use of this Ikhwan army to weaken the Ottomans' hold on the Arabian area, and that the British did that in spite of Churchill's description of these people as, uh, what is it, a bloodthirsty, intolerant, austere, and the quotation goes on as an article of duty and as well as, as an article of faith to kill all who do not share their opinions and to make slaves of their wives and children. But Churchill says, yeah, that's fine, we'll use them. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the British did use two distinct forces in the Arabian Peninsula. One was Ibn Saud, and, and the Ikhwan, given their ruthlessness, were absolutely effective. They were made for purpose for what Britain wanted to achieve, namely the defeat and the dismantlement of the Ottoman Empire. The other person who was involved was the sheriff of Mecca. His name was Hussein bin Ali. And just to fast forward slightly, Hussein bin Ali is the um, grandfather of King Hussein of Jordan. So the long story was that the British did use the Ikhwan and Ibn Saad's forces to pacify that region and effectively rewarded him with the establishment of this new nation state, which bore his name, uh, the family name, Saud, in it. Mm. Um, but also 
they also hedged their bets on the alternative man, uh, Hussein, the sheriff of Mecca, uh, the Hashemite family. And uh, they were eventually defeated by um, Ibn Saud and chased to Jordan and to Iraq, where they formed the, the royal families. But again, it shows you how these sort of uh, Islamic ideologues can be used for military purposes. I mean, they weren't going about in the manner General Clark would describe, you know, let's get a recruitment going on here. No, your best bet was to go for those that are the most fanatical. And of course, one distinction that could be made between Ibn Saud and Hussein was that Ibn Saud uh, was a Wahhabist. And they have a particular Puritan understanding of uh, Islam. And indeed, that ideology forms the underpinnings of what we understand to be global Islamist terror in today's day and age. We can trace that ideology to Ibn Saud's uh, use of the Ikhwani as soldiers against the Ottomans in British interests. Yes, and I think... You having said what you've just said there, people would, some people anyway, probably not people listening to this program, but some people would be surprised then to hear Churchill apparently later writing, quote, my admiration for him, that is Ibn Saud, was deep because of his unfailing loyalty to us, end quote. Of, of course. I mean, if you do the bidding for a particular power, that that's all that's wanted. Yes. They want practical, uh, straightforward allies or better vassals to do their bidding and that is what um, British hegemony was about and what the new American Imperium that started in the second half of the 20th century that's what that was all about and continues to be all about uh, to this very day they are useful soldiers and as we've seen it's been almost like uh, not to trivialize it almost like a traveling show you know, they've been in Chechnya, they were uh, sent to Libya, from Libya, they were transferred to Syria, uh, where there is a stalemate, and they're being defeated. But the idea was that after Syria, they would be transferred to Central Asia to harass the borders of the Russian Federation, and also um, China's uh, Muslim population. How does the Muslim Brotherhood fit into this story? Their name crops up fairly frequently, but I find them rather confusing as an organisation. Um, my understanding, they were founded in the late 1920s in Egypt. They are pan-Islamic, they're not nationalist, and they're a Sunni organisation, but they at least officially renounce violence, but they're considered terrorist organisation by various countries, but um, I understand not by the US, not by the UK. But they had this kind of ambivalent relationship with the British Empire, but they did have some kind of relationship, did they not, with the British very soon after their founding in the late 1920s. What was that relationship like? That's absolutely correct. I'm not um, a major expert on that, but um, in terms of the, the train of events, they have been consistent, relatively consistent allies of British uh, intelligence and the uh, deep state for quite a long time. The only interval was when you had the Arab revolt in Palestine between 1936 and 1939. But uh, other than that, there has been this relationship that has fed in at various times. At the beginning, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, um, it was basically using the Muslim Brotherhood as a means of keeping order in the areas that Britain had acceded to after the overthrow of the Ottoman Empire, given that they now ruled or had influence um, over certain um, created states such as Jordan and Palestine. Um, but it's much clearer after that period of time and particularly when the Americans uh, come to power in the sense that they are used to uh, harass uh, those um, political forces or organizations who are against uh, British interests in that area of the world. And so uh, my knowledge of the Muslim Brotherhood between the late 20s when it was created and the 50s is not particularly um, large. It's once the Americans come into the picture that it takes no, no, on no, a different enough, uh, sure, picture. Sure. Okay, um, but for that 
period that you accepted. Would you say that what they were up to generally with respect to their relationship with British intelligence would have been resisting nationalist movements in the Middle East, where those nationalist movements would be perhaps threatening British control over resources like oil? Do you think that's how they were essentially used? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And th- that blueprint established there was what uh, the Americans then inherited after. Right. OK, well, let's turn to the Americans. Perhaps the most famous aspect of this is Operation Cyclone. Um, so this is starting in 1979 with the CIA funding and training Afghan Mujahideen fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Um, this goes through the 1980s. I think it's a full decade. Now, you mentioned this in the article, and you say that this was essentially the project of Carter's, President Carter's National Security Advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, of course, who died uh, not that long ago. That was a hugely significant operation, or was it not, in this narrative that we're discussing? Um, it seems to be a kind of turning point at which we can see the trajectory leading towards 9-11. Yes, that's true. I mean, it's important to to get a little background, because as I do mention in the article, the relationship between America and the Brazilian Brotherhood dates back to at least the era of Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, during that period in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, although a lot of the people who actually were part of the CIA that was created from the Office of Strategic Services in the Second World War. You know, a lot of them were Arabists. American policy was against the secular nationalist Arab governments rising, such as that of uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. And so what the Muslim Brotherhood were used as were as uh, saboteurs. This idea that they're nonviolent, of course, is not true. They infiltrated where they could, NASA's uh, security apparatus, the civil service, and they committed acts of sabotage and effectively aided the West in on, undermining NASA. Well, was it not actually a Muslim Brotherhood person who attempted to assassinate him that's right that's right Mm. but it's important just to link it to what we want to talk about in afghanistan and 9 11 it's important to bring up the name of saeed uh, kutub this uh, philosopher who effectively is the inspiration uh, for al-qaeda and um, certainly influenced uh, osama bin laden's mentor ayman zawahiri so Kutub, this is the guy, he was an Egyptian, is that right? That's right. And he spent time in the US and he was appalled by what you consider to be the materialism of the West. And uh, that heavily influenced Osama bin Laden? Absolutely. The utter decadence to him um, mm. in terms of what, what he considered to be the relations between men and women uh, also in Western uh, individualistic uh, society. And uh, NASA did spare his life for a while, but uh, he was uh, executed by NASA. So he he turns out to be a martyr of sorts. Um, It may be a complicated feature, but it's worth drawing a distinction between the Muslim Brotherhood, that Egyptian originated organization, from Wahhabism. Um, And I think this is a a bit of the background um, to the recent history of Egypt and the overthrow of the government that uh, came out of the so-called uh, Arab Spring. The Muslim Brotherhood, um, they do profess non-violence, but that's not totally true. Right. But also they are apparently believers in democracy. And that's a fundamental distinction between the Muslim Brotherhood and its brand of Islamic fundamentalism and that of Wahhabism, this right. Puritan authoritarian regime, which may accommodate the idea of having a king, as the Saudis do, or having a caliph at the head of it. So that, that's at least one minor distinction we can make. When we go over to Afghanistan, um, we're not necessarily dealing with people who subscribe to the Muslim Brotherhood uh, philosophy exclusively. They were Islamic fundamentalists influenced um, by all sides, um, including Wahhabism. Okay, so turning back to Afghanistan, there is some debate as to whether this policy of Operation Cyclone was a means of fighting a proxy war against the Soviets, so as to draw them into their their Vietnam, so to speak, to bleed them dry, or whether this was essentially a way of fighting Afghan communism, now that Afghanistan was now communist, just as part of the so-called Cold War in general. 
and then seeing an opportunity to bleed Russia dry. There seemed to be some ambiguity there as to what was intended with this Operation Cyclone. What's your view about it? I mean, I think fundamentally it was about combating uh, Soviet communism and its manifestation in, in, in Afghanistan. But those who propound the view, uh, led by Brzezinski, the late Brzezinski himself, do say that it was a pre-designed ploy to actually lure them in there to meet this uh, Mujahideen. I think it's something that will continue to be debated upon. I, I don't think it can be definitively said. But as the policy developed throughout the 1980s, the, uh, the invasion occurred in 1979. And of course, there was the transfer from the Carter administration to the Reagan administration. And there was no change in that. The fundamentals was that America urged Saudi Arabia to provide funding. The Pakistanis under their strongman leader, General Zia ul Haq, to also provide uh, logistics. And uh, the Americans would also provide funding to train these jihadists, known as the Mujahideen, to fight the Soviet uh, invasion. And I think as time went on, it became clear that this was then something that could bleed the Soviet Union dry, that the Americans could understand, ah, this is looking like their Vietnam, like what we encountered in Vietnam. And these Afghan warriors, even going back to pre-Islamic times at the time of Alexander the Great, you know, nobody's managed ever to totally tame them or pacify them or conquer them. We could be onto something there. And it, it, the policy definitely germinated into one in which the uh, Soviet Union would be sufficiently weakened. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Yes, as I said to you before the interview, I think it's a bit of a red herring worrying too much about what the original intention was here and what we're to make of what Bozinski has said in various interviews, reporters having said one thing in an in interview and then having denied it in other places. Um, a bit of a red herring because it ended up being this sending of Afghan Mujahideen as proxies for what the West wanted to do. Um, and they were being radicalized by the West. I mean, um, I have information here from Nafiz Ahmed's excellent book, The War on Truth, where I'll quote from him, quote, central to the US-sponsored operation was the attempt to manufacture an extremist religious ideology by amalgamating the local Afghan feudal traditions with Islamic rhetoric um, and then he's quoting from a newspaper here, a mainstream newspaper. Predominant themes were that Islam was a complete socio-political ideology, but holy Islam was being violated by the atheistic Soviet troops and that the Islamic people of Afghanistan should reassert their independence by overthrowing the leftist Afghan regime propped up by Moscow, unquote. But I will continue because this is very striking here. Uh, Nafis continues, among the myriad of policies designed to generate the desired level of extremism, the U.S. funded to the tune of millions of dollars the production and distribution in Afghanistan of school textbooks promoting the war values of murder and fanaticism. And this is quoting here from the Washington Post. The primers which were filled with talk of jihad and featured drawings of guns, bullets, soldiers and mines have served since then as the Afghan school system's core curriculum. Even the Taliban used the American-produced books. End quote. That's ending the Washington Post quote there. And uh, Nafis continues, The Post cited anonymous U.S. officials admitting that the textbooks, quote, steeped a generation in violence, unquote. 
So that's quite damning. Um, in fact, it's very damning, is it not, that this is not just the use of proxies, but this is actually the cultivation of extremism itself for the purposes of this, so that your boys were not getting killed, but somebody else is getting killed, and you were actually creating this monster yourself. Yes, that, that is an absolutely amazing uh, extract. Again, it goes towards those Western notions uh, what we discussed earlier on in regard to the Germans and the British Empire about harnessing Islam wherever you can and the fundamentalist tendencies to do battle, to be rigid and to be capable of uh, accomplishing a particular goal with uh, a fanatical mindset. On the one hand, yes, it was predicated on kind of a racial disparaging form of Orientalism. But of course, there's a reality to that as well. As General Clark said himself in that uh, CNN interview that you mentioned earlier before, you know, what is also interesting is that Pakistan was involved and, uh, you know, Britain was involved. Um, I'm sure you're aware about that um, quote by Margaret Thatcher when she visited the Afghan border with Pakistan, oh, state yes. visit with the uh, General uh, or hack where she is yes, a god is with you or something like that. Well, she, yeah, she says that the, the hearts of the uh, free loving world are with you. Oh, um, right, right, yes. Words to that effect, mm. and these are the forebears of the Taliban. Trying to destroy both your religion, your way of life, and your independence. I want to say that the hearts of the free world are with you, and with those of your countrymen. So absolutely harnessing that fundamentalist aspect of Islam has time and again been crucial. Now, you go back, and I'm sure it will be mentioned in Mr. Curtis's book, Britain was involved, America was involved, but it's not well known that Israel was also involved. Israel also had a motivation for undermining the Soviet Union because uh, Israel came to view the Soviet Union, although it was the first country to offer a created state of Israel de facto recognition, what transpired later on was to set in motion this belief that the Soviet Union was an enemy of the state of Israel and of the Jewish people. And that has to do with the Stalinist purges, the doctor's plot, and the attacks on uh, Jews in the Soviet Union, who it was felt had a divided loyalty between the state of Israel and the Soviet Union. And then also, as time transpired, the Soviet Union was the backer of many Arab liberation organizations, including the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And so for that reason, while Ehud Barak was the head of Amman, uh, Israeli intelligence, in that time in the early 1980s, Israel offered support to the most virulent anti-Western militia. Um, it was known as uh, Hezb al-Islami Mujahideen, and they were headed by Golbodin uh, Hekmatia. And they were supplied with weapons Israel had uh, acquired from the war in Lebanon, which was to purge Lebanon of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And so the uh, Golbodin group, as time went on after the Afghan war had ended, he fell out with his Saudi sponsors. But in due course, those uh, members of his organization, a number of them, actually uh, were transformed into members of the Taliban. So that's a very, very useful quote you mentioned there. Of course, the Afghan people, by heritage, are warlike but if you add this idea of uh, Islamic fundamentalism and particularly Wahhabism to it, uh, you have a really potent brew. And uh, it's no surprise that many people posit what transpired in Afghanistan, this support militarily, educationally, this uh, is what has now led to the uh, global Islamist movement uh, as represented by uh, Al-Qaeda and now it's offshoots of uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and uh, its so-called Islamic State. It's an incredibly complex tapestry indeed. Now, it's often said, of course, that uh, the West has created 
Islamic uh, extremism. That's not really true from the conversation we're having here, but there's no doubt that it has fanned into flame that tendency to an incredible extent. So there is some truth to that statement, is there not, even though it is an exaggeration? Yeah, it's it's harnessed it is the best way to yeah. say it. I mean, it's it's there and, it, and it's dormant. The West did not create it, but they have facilitated it. They've harnessed mm. it, you know. Well, just before we finish, I want to look very briefly at the other wing of this that you bring up. So this was your concern over the way in which known terrorists are found to have been monitored by the intelligence services, intelligence agencies for quite some period of time, months, years, and seems like a blind eye has turned to them, um, especially if they go and fight for what the (laughs) government thinks is the right causes, and then they end up, um, surprise, surprise, committing or allegedly committing terrorist acts in the West, or perhaps even, you know, serving as patsies in some cases, manipulated by some kind of gladio-like operation, maybe, and maybe we'll talk about that briefly as a possibility. Um... So this concern over what you might call intelligence failures, are they always intelligence failures or are we looking sometimes at the case where a so-called intelligence failure is an intelligence success? It was supposed to fail and these individuals were supposed to carry out these attacks. And What's your general impression of this whole murky area? Well, my view is that, uh, yes, the intelligence world has those conventional features that much of the general public uh, would tend to understand, you know, uh, people who monitor things, who report on things, people who turn into spies. Mm -hmm. But there is a dark art to intelligence. There is a murky side, uh, one that is Machiavellian, totally immoral. You may actually come across uh, situations where intelligence services are creating false flags, for instance. I mean, um, there's a, a Turkish general who once admitted that in the troubles in Cyprus, the Turkish military blew up mosques in order to blame it on the Christian Cypriots. So what I put into that uh, write-up I did was um, uh, the Salman Abedi story going back to what we discussed about Libya and the overthrow of Gaddafi, uh, Manchester, where Abedi came from, is the home of a small but distinguishable Libyan exile population. They were exiled while Gaddafi was in power. And with the coming of the war on terror, you had people who were under control orders, that is a form of uh, house arrest under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. And these people were offered a, a deal You can remain in the position you are in now, or we will release you. We will grant you passports if you go and fight Colonel Gaddafi. So that's the first thing. I mean, they are going against the rules of the game. Um, And with Abedi, we don't have yet much evidence about his precise workings. But we do have that very important uh, issue of um, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, being contradicted by the FBI in America, because she, after the Manchester bomb went off, uh, Theresa May claimed that Abedi had been a lone wolf. But the FBI report said, no, we'd actually informed you that this man was likely part of a North African cell who were plotting the assassination of a high-ranking British official. So as it turned out, not accurate information, but information nonetheless. Yet this man, despite that warning, had gone under the radar. It does give a lot of cause for concern. And brings up the question whether going under the radar really is going under the radar in some cases. Well, this is the thing, because we have examples in America with Tamerlane Sarnayev, the man uh, who, along with his brother, was um, fingered for being the Boston Marathon bombers. Mm. Uh, we have uh, Mohammed Mera, who was an Islamist, who was suspected of being the shooter in the killings in Toulouse and uh, Montalban. These people, I mean, with Sarnayev, I mean, the FBI deny that he was an agent of theirs. But um, there is evidence, uh, certainly an investigative journalist uh, named Michelle McPhee, 
Uh, she's just written a book called Maximum Harm, and she believes, like a lot of people do believe, because the FBI hasn't released all the documents in its control, uh, believe that uh, Zarnaev was an FBI agent, and he may have gone rogue uh, because he was denied American citizenship. In general terms, what one is very conscious of is that any time there's a terrorist outrage in North America or Western Europe, the question immediately is, should the laws be tightened up? Therefore, rights and freedoms, should they be taken away from the citizenry? <laughs> and the other point, obviously, is military action. Should military action already in existence be escalated? Mm. Or should this terrorist outrage become the basis of a fresh form of military intervention? And I think at various points in time, they might be acting towards an agenda, as we've seen in Italy, where Operation Gladio was in effect, and the investigations of George Felipe Casson and the revelations of the neo-fascist Vinci Guerra, that people were set up by the government to commit certain acts which would then influence the public mindset. Because what happens after these terror attacks is fear, rage, and those emotions can then be used to form the basis of what we've just said, changing the law or affecting uh, some form of uh, military intervention. And what happened after Manchester? What did we hear? We, Apart from uh, what has already transpired with these uh, extraordinary powers for um, looking over people's internet communications, uh, we're having thoughts about uh, internment, such as occurred at the height of the Irish Troubles in the early 70s. Uh, we're hearing about new uh, forms of uh, censorship on the internet. So that cannot be ruled out from what the evidence we have from history says. And it's a very, very serious matter that should be discussed more in Absolutely. the public domain and not be dismissed. And of course, the official position on Operation Gladio is that, well, that doesn't exist anymore. Even if it did exist, uh, it doesn't now. But then, of course, going back to those days, it wasn't officially known about anyway. So <laughs> you could say that maybe something's going on today and that's not officially known about either. So, um, so take that argument as very serious. Um, I have no reason to believe that that does not continue in some form. And of course, as we've had on this show before, um, people are talking in terms of Gladio B, which could be very much alive. Um, so really, it brings us to something that we did touch on at the beginning, which was what you hold out as a possible solution to this. Okay, there needs to be this overhaul of Western foreign policy. And you suggest the only way that this is going to happen is if there are mass protests by people who actually understand what is happening, or at least have well-defined questions, so that when they hear things on the news, they're saying, well, is that really the truth? And are then thinking in these kinds of ways, asking these kinds of questions, and protesting in some form, and also bringing, this is the second arm of what you suggest, political pressure in some way on the establishment. So what do you have in mind here? What kind of protest and what kind of pressure? Well, I think that the public are sufficiently informed today or have the means to be informed today to understand what we've discussed uh, throughout this interview about this overarching policy of the West utilizing Islamic fanatics to do their bidding in terms of achieving Western geopolitical objectives, and that these have had very poor ramifications mm. um, in terms of refugees and, and you know, commission of acts of terror. You say have the means, have the means to be informed, but by and large, I find in the people I speak to in ordinary life, they haven't got this consciousness, even though many of the things we've referred to here today are in mainstream publications you think that people would be aware. And yet I find personally a lot of people are not aware. I think there's enough information there. And, and certainly because of the nature of the corporate press, you will very rarely find somebody who joins the dots together. So I guess what I'm saying is that that information is there. You know, General Clark, who we've referred to, uh, issues to do with Operation Cyclone, they're there in the mainstream press. But very rarely is it put together. It's only put together by voices 
outside of the mainstream press. And that's tragic because I think that knowledge, mm. that consciousness could create a public movement that is not predicated on your ideological persuasion, you know, which mm. takes us back to the beginning of our conversation, namely the way in which these issues, the effects are used as some form of ideological football in the United States, you know, the Democrats versus the Republicans, yeah. whereas the public should be getting together irrespective of that and pressuring their legislators, you know, through their constituencies and also the creation of movements, mass movements, as we used to see protest movements in the past mm -hmm. will call for this policy to stop. I mean, the only one that comes to my mind is stop the war, which Mm -hmm. It seems to be uh, something that is considered and may actually be something that is the preserve of those on the left. No, we want something that has more universal appeal than that. But when we talk about stop the war, it's not just direct military action, which is obvious to see, but these covert means by which the intelligence services give support. So that is for the public. For the politicians, I mean, you would expect that they are well informed to understand these things but again they do not take it further in terms of the questions that are asked in parliament you know when hillary ben stands up there and criticizes and says you know we should then send the royal air force and its six planes to bomb iraq or northern syria people have to think well hang on what has hasn't britain played a part in it didn't The Guardian and other Western papers report that uh, British and French soldiers in the early part of the Syrian conflict were at the borders, you know, with Jordan and countries like that, offering training to any rebels? You know, that's illegal to <laughs> plot to overthrow a foreign government. And so we should be having parliamentary inquiries in, 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 into this. But the politicians do not seem to be able to accomplish that. And I think that's a, another interview as to why that is the case. Well, indeed, there seems to be an acceptable sphere of discourse and the kind of things that we've talked about today, even though they're there in this compartmentalized way in the mainstream media sources, cannot be discussed, as you say, in this joined up way for fear of being considered a conspiracy theorist or somebody who is actually, you know, supporting the terrorists or these kinds of accusations come out. I find it very difficult to see how we can move beyond that. And you have the other difficulty that within, um, I mean, I've been talking to G. Edward Griffin fairly recently about the truth movement and how that has achieved certain things. And yet in other respects, you know, it has its problems. There's all that difficulty there, which in some cases is muddying the waters. You know, before we had this interview, I was mentioning to you the fact that when the Manchester bombing happened, there were all these people coming out saying that it was a hoax, that it didn't actually happen. You know, it was all fake. And I was immediately hit by that because I have relatives who live over the road from people who lost children in that particular attack. So I know it wasn't fake. And yet we have some of these narratives being generated within what you might call the truth movement in this very broad sense, muddying the waters, causing this kind of disruption so that people can look upon that and say, well, anybody who's considering anything outside of this acceptable sphere of discourse is a nutcase. So therefore, people will not venture into even the reasonable things that we've been talking about today for fear of that accusation. How is it possible to move beyond that? Um, all I can say is that those within what may be termed alternative media, that is, those who are not controlled by the demands of uh, academic funding or political party allegiance or the power of certain lobbies, they should really just focus on the points that are indisputable and those that are of logical imputation. I mean, that's all I can suggest at the moment, because I think it's muddied on all accounts. Mm. An insocuent public, what can you do about that? Ineffectual politicians, what can you do about that? And we know that journalists, you know, that phrase or that word prostitute, what an invention. 
that really does sum up the lack of courage among those who are in the profession of journalism. And so those factors should also be taken into account when we look at the truth movement uh, for these people through probably laziness or some people allege that they're actually agents who are there to just sow disinformation. Uh, it's not helpful. So all we can do in our writing is essentially to um, focus on rational argument and uh, looking at solid historical and contemporary mm. backups uh, to it. It's important when we also discuss these issues where the mainstream fear to tread, that um, we also make a note that things are compartmentalized and uh, literally so within the intelligence services. I mean, right. these suspected false flags that may occur, it may not be the prime minister of the day arranging it. Absolutely. I mean, I Absolutely. doubt if Obama had as much to do with the coup in Ukraine as did Victoria Newland and uh, John McCain did. Uh, do you see uh, what we talked about, the double government and the continuation of this policy, regardless of who was in power? And I, I've heard people talk in terms of there being a double CIA and a double MI6 <laughs> and all this sort of thing. But why not? That makes complete sense. Why, Absolutely, it, Julia. About, I mean, the, the, yeah. I, I think at times I have made the mistake of giving the impression that when I'm talking about the deep state, I mean the intelligence services, and I don't really mean that. It's easy to fall into that trap. What I mean is that that web, of deep interconnections, very influential and powerful interconnections, which will touch upon all sorts of structures within society so that there will be people within particular organisations who are represented in that deep state and there will be other people who know nothing about it at all. It's completely opaque to them. That very is difficult, that Very difficult thing to define. Is that the kind of thing that you mean? That's what I mean when I talk about the deep state. Yes, I mean, I think that um, certainly the people who sponsor the politicians corporations and, and the like have an influence on these questions, uh, whether certain countries are invaded and uh, whether insurrections are started. It really only stands to reason that that is the case. And remember who sponsors these think tanks, up to those that are the so-called respectable ones, uh, you know, the Brookings Institute and uh, uh, the RAND Corporation, albeit that it's a right-wing body, but it's a prominent and influential body with the affiliations with the U.S. military going back a long period of time. But within security services, there's no question that you do even have competing factions within them. Mm. I mean, unlike in Western Europe, where after the Second World War, the West did appropriate uh, figures from the uh, fascist and Nazi ancien regimes and install them to be heads of their security services, Britain had a, a more diffuse one because you had people from the left, you had people from the right. And, you know, we know that from those defectors. And, um, you know, the story of Peter Wright, whose information may not have been reliable in some ways, but I think it's fairly clear that there was a, an element in MI5, not the whole of MI5, who were working towards the destabilization of Harold Wilson's government. And that that segment within MI5 joined forces with bits of military intelligence. And, you know, the military intelligence specifically, the one that was operating out of Northern Ireland and developed Operation Clockwork Orange, which was this disinformation campaign against uh, certain prominent British political figures. I mean, this is all fact. And so that compartmentalization does occur. As I was telling you before the interview, um, I did get a message through one of my websites from somebody who has a managerial post in, in NATO, a former U.S. Army officer. And in regard to my article on the Manchester bombing, you know, whether it was criminal negligence or something more sinister, he informed me that a member of his staff had reached more or less the same conclusions that I, I had in my article, but that they had not put it in their final report, you know, but he was just interested in what I had to say. So um, it's a very murky area. Yeah, that is quite an amazing thing to happen. Um, very, very revealing. 
So we're nearing the end of our conversation here. So if there's anything you'd like to stress for people listening today, what would that be? Well, I mean, there's there's blowback to re-emphasize to the public at large that, you know, look at the blowback that has occurred. And that should reinforce this idea that, um, look, your rights and freedoms are always on the threat and military intervention is always on the line. It's time for a stop. Let's have some sort of public conscious mass effort through, you know, groups that have been created for the express purpose of putting pressure to stop this decades, centuries long policy, you know, utterly cynical in its uh, nature and its execution. Well, let me come back to you again about this business of blowback then. You recall that I mentioned what Tom Secker says about it, that it's only a partial explanation. And so if you use it as perhaps the main way of getting people to oppose war, as a me- as a sort of hermeneutic to understand why terror is happening at home, is there not a danger then of feeding into the very problem that we're trying to overcome of this circumscribed sphere of discourse? It's okay to talk about blowback. It's not okay to talk about even the possibility that some faction within your own intelligence services might be aiding and abetting this. If you just concentrate upon blowback, you are creating the very conditions under which this can be perpetuated. Well, we we don't focus just on blowback. Yes, we need to keep on disseminating the whole picture. Mm. But blowback as a reminder that these compartmentalized discussions uh, that are had over immigration, refugees, should the law be tightened up in regard to the internet, these are not taken in isolation of one act of terrorism. But the wider picture should always be borne in mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also just to add to what we're discussing about the issue of oversight by politicians, again, I think there is that element of compartmentalization because after Gladio, there were some commissions set up, legislative commissions set up in a number of Western European countries, but it was very, very limited and eventually swept under the carpet. And the same thing in the United States, um, just one of those suspect um, bombings, acts of terror in the name of Islam, was subject to this uh, congressional uh, oversight. That was the one to do with the Boston Marathon bombing and uh, Tamerlan Tsarnaev, there was a congressional inquiry, and it did find that the FBI missed many chances, not just one, several chances for actually catching him. But that was just compartmentalized. It doesn't link into the wider picture, you know, for instance, in regard to that report by Human Rights Watch in coordination with the Colombian Law School and its Human Rights Institute, which said that um, all but four of the major Islamic terrorist incidents to have occurred in the United States since 9-11 for a 10-year period were to do with FBI sting operations. That would actually encompass issues of not just blowback, but the actual whole strategy of how informants are being handled. And if we had that kind of scrutiny in a more coherent, dedicated fashion, then I think we might have less of this problem. If it's a problem of negligence or if it's a problem of uh, that there might be some uh, method or reason for taking people off the radar. Which is why conversations like this are extremely important and there need to be more of them, no matter how challenging they are actually to engage with or even to prepare for, because there's so much information here. It is important that these conversations are had because they create this narrative, they create this broad picture, which does inform a different way of looking at the events that are happening in the world. And it is so important that people do have that broad picture, otherwise it remains compartmentalised in our minds. All these little things are not joined together and they can therefore be put into categories that are conducive to a normal understanding of what's going on when in fact it may be an abnormal reality that we're facing here. 
And as you say, conversations based upon the evidence that's actually there, not just conjecture. These kinds of evidence-based conversations, I think, are vital. And I thank you very much indeed, Adi Yenka, for coming back on to have such a conversation. Um, I'm amazed at your erudition and the way that you can recall this information on the spot so well. It's a delight and a privilege to speak to you. And I thank you very much for coming back on the programme. And I very much hope that people enjoyed this and will have learnt from it. And also they will follow some of the links that I will put, well, many links I'll probably put in the show notes to back up to evidence a lot of the things that have been said here today. Thank you very much, Adi Inka, for coming on again. Thank you, Julian. It was a pleasure.